Good day, and uh, it's so good to be here with you again. Uh, this is the second Sunday of Advent, as we're moving closer and closer to the celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, I hope you've been able to uh, take some time over the last week, at least, to uh, spend some time in the scripture, maybe Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2, uh, look at the Christmas story there. And, uh, and in your activities, you would ponder and consider what a marvelous, indeed, gift that God has given to us, uh, his son, Jesus Christ. So as, as I was preparing for today, uh, you know, I was pondering, as I suggested maybe you were, Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke chapter 1 and 2, those wonderful stories that uh, two gospel writers provide for us on that uh, that advent of, of, the, of Christ. And um, I came across an article that was talking about our, uh, Advent. And anyways, with all that in mind, I, I put together an introduction that I want to share with you. And it goes something like this. Here is the place where it all happened. You know, beyond that village, along a dark and twisting uh, path to the very spot, a disturbing scene. There asleep on the ground near the dwindling uh, fire lay the peasant girl, wrapped in a dirty blanket, her hair sprinkled with pieces of straw, all tangled and messy, and the long, hard, exhausting night written across her sleeping face. And she is so young. And beside this exhausted girl lying in a dirty, crude feeding trough is a sleeping newborn, wrapped in blood-smeared cloths, and then the scene moves quickly uh, to another time and place. And the sights and sounds of the Advent season all around. And full of memories and traditions. Overflowing and bustling with the activity and bursting at the seams with potentially new traditions and the making of many new memories. And how vast is the contrast from that dark, and distressing sight, that, that place at the end of the dark and twisting path where that exhausted peasant girl and the child sleep. How strange the scene is. It's nothing like the major scenes of the colorful children's illustrated books. We know this girl and her baby, and we're not prepared for what we see. It doesn't feel like the Christmas we know and, and hope for, is something that we might find under an abandoned and neglected bridge. It feels more like the undesirable and hopeless homeless. Something that we might find in some broken down shack on the other side of the tracks. We know this girl and her baby, and pity and sadness fill us. The poor girl and her baby. We see it as it really was, and our impulse is to help them. But the words echo so loudly, there was no room for them in the inn. Surely there's some place, any place other than the cold ground. Is there not a room somewhere? Can we not find some room somewhere? And there we stand among the half-trimmed tree and the pots and pans in the sink and the stress of all the bustling Christmas activities sitting on our shoulders. And we can't get that picture out of our minds. The pathetic picture of the holy homeless mother and child. There was no room for the advent of the sleeping baby. Surely, we say, surely we can find some room somewhere. But can we? Can we? Please turn in your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9. And we'll pick it up at verse 9. And we'll read through to verse 13. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? 
But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Our Lord and God, we thank you. As we look at this text, as we ponder uh, the Christmas story of so long ago, as we prepare our hearts and minds this Advent season for the celebration of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, his birth. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to understand the, the full meaning of that and the implications of that for our lives. And Lord, may we do so with our eyes on the future when Jesus will come again and set things right and make things new. We praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, as we uh, look at this particular text in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, it would be appropriate that we have an overview of the events leading up to this point where we are going to spend some time. It will, it will be profitable for us for our situ situational awareness but more importantly, and this is my hope for all of us, that we understand the bigger picture, that we don't get lost amongst the trees and miss the forest. So in doing this, we're going to be looking at Matthew's gospel in a broader way and bring us here to chapter 9, verse 9. We see this, that Jesus, after he had finished the Sermon on the Mount, where you'll find in chapter 5 through to 7 of Matthew's gospel, Jesus then made his way to Capernaum. And Capernaum was a fishing village on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. This all began here in chapter 8, verse 1. And along the way, Matthew, Matthew's gospel records a number of healings that Jesus performed as the crowds followed him. We see the leper that he healed in chapter 8, verse 2 to 4. And then later, when Jesus stayed at Peter's house, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law from a fever, chapter 8, verse 14. And on that very same day, before the end of the day, in the evening, the text tells us that people brought to him many who were oppressed by demons. And Jesus cast out the spirits with a word and healed all those who were sick. Verse 16 of chapter 8. And, and let's just press pause for a moment right here at this specific uh, location. In this text, when we consider the whole of Matthew's gospel, all 28 chapters, it is noteworthy that Matthew clearly establishes the identity of Jesus. So who is Jesus? Well, Jesus, according to Matthew, is the Christ. Jesus is the promised Messiah of God that Israel had been promised many, many centuries before by God himself. As an example, on this occasion, here in our text at Peter's home, Matthew reminds us that Jesus is the promised Messiah of God. After Jesus had cast out the demons of the oppressed and healed many others of their illnesses, Matthew said this, that all this was to fulfill something. And Matthew said this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Chapter 8, verse 17. See, Matthew there was drawing from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 4 to 5. Now, we don't have time to unpack Isaiah here, but here, but the point is this. When we read the Gospels, like Matthew's Gospel, we need to keep in mind that the authors are not overly concerned with recording every detail and every event, as the Holy Spirit inspired them to write their gospel accounts. Each gospel writer, in their way, unpacks and reveals to its audience, the reader, the identity of this Jesus of Nazareth that crowds followed here and there and everywhere. Let's track some of this together. We see the miracles of healings that I, a healing that I already mentioned, beginning with the leper in chapter 8, verse 2 to 4. And then there's the healing we see in chapter 4, uh, verse 14 to 17. There's Jesus casting out the demons in chapter 8, 17, and then later in verse 28 and thir to 34. The calming of the storm 
uh, on the Sea of Galilee, chapter 8, verse 23 to 27. And the faith of the centurion that Jesus commands so highly in chapter 8, verse 5 to 13. All of these, my friends, all of them point, points to the identity of Jesus of Nazareth. Isaiah the prophet himself, long before this event here, uh, long before the time of Jesus, prophesied of the Messiah, the promised Messiah. We see this in Isaiah 52 and 53 and 54. And man, we could speak so many about other prophets as well, but we take Isaiah and all these events we just read here, these brief ones here, and all the Gospels, and this reveals to us that Jesus fulfilled not just Isaiah chapter 54, four to, verse 4 to 5, but every single prophecy about him from Genesis to Malachi in the 39 books of the Old Testament. Every single prophecy of Jesus was fulfilled by Jesus himself. Well, friends, this brings us to Matthew chapter 9. In the careful reading from chapter 8 on to chapter 9, we discover that Jesus eventually left Capernaum, traveled by both southeast across the Sea of Galilee to the area of what was called at the time the Gadarenes. Chapter 8, verse 28. And there Matthew describes Jesus' encounter with two men oppressed with demons. And he casts them out into the pigs. The story is there for you to read in chapter 8, verse 28 to 34. Then Jesus left the region and returned back to Capernaum again via the Sea of Galilee. And the very next event that we see here in Matthew's timetable, he record, Matthew records the healing of the paralytic by Jesus. And this paralytic was brought to Jesus, special delivery for Mark Chapter 2 describes that he was brought through the roof by his friends, for there was no way for him to get into the front door. And I will leave that scene for you to investigate and digest it more in your own study time, because now we finally come to the text for today. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9 to 13. And as we consider this text a little closer, we should be also aware that Mark and Luke in their Gospels also record the same event as here in Matthew's gospel. And this is very helpful to make a complete picture or a better picture, if you will. In Luke, we see that he reveals that Matthew was also called Levi. And maybe the question is why? Why does he have Matthew here and Levi there? Well, it was common for people in that day to have two, maybe even three names. A Greek name, a Hebrew name, for example, and maybe even a Latin name. And even two Hebrew names like we have here, Matthew in Matthew's Gospel and Levi in Luke's Gospel. Moving along, Mark also reveals that Matthew was the son of Alphaeus in Mark chapter 2, verse 14. And if you check that out a little closer, you'll see that he was was the brother of James the Lesser, who's recorded there as having, uh, was as as the son of Alphaeus. But the more important part of this all with Mark and Luke and Matthew, is the context that we have here is that we find out uh, Matthew's trade. That he was a tax tax collector who was sitting at the booth when Jesus passed by. Now we need to say a few things about tax collectors. What we know from history is that the Romans were very efficient and methodical in their collecting of taxes. And they often employed the Jews in uh, in Judea to collect their taxes. When we consider this sort of thing happening in that first century setting, under Roman rule, the taxes had become particularly burdensome to the Jewish people and to others as well. Every, for example, uh, when you consider the Jewish person himself and back in the first century, uh, Jewish male, 20 or older would, uh, would pay the annual temple tax of one day's wages, which was required from, for them every year. And that was to upkeep the temple and all those things in their place of worship there. But additionally, all non-Roman citizens had to pay a direct tax, including a land tax, uh, if they owned land, and the head tax of one day's wages per year to Rome. One day's wages per year to Rome, every single individual. And everyone had to pay, 
indirect taxes, such as customs duty and sales tax and tolls, etc. And tax collectors like Matthew would set up their booths in near a city or near a community to collect tolls and custom duties on the goods that came by. And Matthew, that was his, his job, that's a, the contract he had received, would have been regarded by his kin, that is other Jewish people, as a traitor. They would have considered him a collaborator with the Romans against his own people. And we also know that tax collectors in Jesus' days, days were notorious for their dishonesty. For the Romans would collect only what was required by the law, and the tax collector was allowed to keep anything over and above. And overcharging then was a common practice by tax collectors like Matthew. And when we consider Matthew as a Jew, who was given a contract to collect taxes, he was also considered an outcast from society. There were been things that Matthew would be disqualified to participate in. He could never be a judge in a court or a witness in a court. He would have been excommunicated from the synagogue, so he had no place to go to worship. And Matthew's family, unfortunately, would also be disgraced. And now enter Jesus into our story here that Matthew records. And as he was passing by, he saw Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to Matthew, follow me. Now we need to do a little bit of word study. The Greek word that Matthew uses here in this context, in this particular setting, uh, translated in our Bibles as follow, means exactly that, follow. You know, but as good as our, the translations may be, that we, may, we can miss the fuller meaning or the fully, fuller intent of this word. Because this was not a suggestion here, or even an invitation, if you will. It is a command. In the Greek word, this is a present imperative. In effect, what Jesus was saying to Matthew was, follow me now. And keep on following me as a way of life and all the implications that come from following me as well. It was not a suggestion or even an invitation. So how did Matthew respond? Well, the text tells us in verse 9, Matthew rose and followed him. Luke, in his gospel, puts it this way. And leaving everything, in other words, he left his tool, tool, toll booth, he rose and followed Jesus. Luke chapter 5, verse 28. Well, we want to go back to Matthew chapter 8 for a moment. And we'll find there this very same word, this very same Greek word, this present imperative, this command being used there in another situation. We see there the story of many who considered themselves a disciple, and one of them who considered themselves a disciple of, of Jesus asked Jesus, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus replied, follow me, and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Chapter 8, verse 21 and, and 22. Now, we don't know if this fellow's father had really died. Now, Jesus' response uh, may indicate that this has not been the case. Nevertheless, if there was any doubt at this point um, uh, that G what Jesus meant by following him, later on Jesus said this to his disciples in Matthew's Gospel. If anyone would come after him, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whomever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 to 26. So the question is, what happened here with Matthew? Why was Matthew's response different than uh, the disciple who wanted to follow Jesus after he buried his father, if indeed he had a father that died? Now, there's a lot of things, a lot of ways we can handle this, you know, uh, and, and certainly we need to understand the Holy Spirit was involved in these stories. Uh, God draws the person to himself by his spirit. 
But the, the question that I really want to ask about this event here, as we compare Matthew's response to that other dis so-called disciples' response, what about you and me? Are we following Jesus like Matthew did? Or are we saying to Jesus, let me go and take care of this and that and this other thing, and then maybe later I will follow you? Are we denying ourselves for the sake of Jesus? Or are we seeking to gain the world? You see, salvation, the Word of God teaches, is nothing that we do. But it's all that God has done for us in Christ. Salvation, according to the Word of God, is God's gift of grace to you and me. Apostle Paul all too well understood this. For he writes in his letter to the uh, church at Ephesus, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a, a result of works, so that no one may boast. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. So what was the difference then? We're looking back here at Matthew and the other disciple. Three words. True saving faith. True saving faith results, as one commentator put it, quote, a correspond, results in a corresponding and recognizable life change. We go back to Ephesians chapter 2. And let's read chapter 2, verse 8 to 10 together. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, and we should walk in them. Moving on to verse 11 to 13, we see here uh, in verse 11 to 13 that for Matthew there was a great, there was a recognizable life change. Luke uh, accounts this story in this way. And Levi made him a great feast at his house. Who was him? It was Jesus. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. Luke chapter 5, verse 29. One moment Matthew was sitting at, the tax, at his tax booth, and the next he's reclining with Jesus and many of his former business associates in the tax collection business having a meal with Jesus. Luke goes on in his account to tell of another story, another tax collector. One time Jesus was passing through Jericho where he encountered what Luke describes as a chief tax collector. A chief tax collector. Luke chapter 19, verse 2. In other words, this person would have had many tax collectors working for himself. He had franchised his contract with the Romans. And his name was Zacchaeus. And according to Luke, Zacchaeus was rich. Luke 19.2. And one time, as Jesus was coming in, there were so many crowds, uh, Zacchaeus climbed a tree so he could see Jesus over the crowds. And as Jesus was passing by where Zacchaeus was, he looked up and he invited himself to Zacchaeus' house. And Luke describes what happened next. Zacchaeus hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Luke 19.6. Why? Why did Matthew... And Zacchaeus welcomed Jesus into their homes. Was it because they wanted to be around a popular person like Jesus, who had the whole place stirred up everywhere with all his healing and casting out of demons? Why? May I suggest that salvation has found its home in the hearts of these two former cheating tax collectors and sinners. And their actions proved it. There was a recognizable life change. And in both these stories, uh, the one in, Ma in Matthew here and in Luke, uh, we see the naysayers. There's always naysayers, it seems. And in Jesus' day, there were many naysayers, and they were the Pharisees, the teachers, and scribes, and the religious leaders of Israel at the time. In verse 11, we read, And the Pharisees saw this, and they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Luke describes this account in a different way. 
The Pharisees grumbled at his disciples, Luke 5.30. And the same thing happened to Zacchaeus when he brought Jesus into his home. They all grumbled. He, speaking of Jesus, has gone in to be a guest of a man who is a sinner, Luke 19, uh, verse 7. Let's go back to our text. What did Jesus say in reply to these naysayers? He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Verse 12. Consider with me how ironic the statement would have sounded and seemed back in that context. You see, the very ones who were charged with the spiritual nurturing and shepherding of Israel were acting like doctors who wanted to avoid all contact with the sick. The very ones who were responsible to dispense the whole counsel, the whole counsel of God's holy word, refused to administer the spiritual healing that God offered the sinner. Matthew, unlike Luke and Mark, gives us, you and me, the reader, an insight into God's condemnation of the Pharisees and their followers. As Jesus said to them, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Verse 13. There Jesus quoted Hosea, the prophet, from chapter 6, verse 6. And when we look at Hosea's life and ministry, we see Hosea exhorting God's people in his day who seemed to be very good at bringing sacrifices, but had ditched and dumped the mercy of God. They had given up, in essence, the knowledge and the truth of God in the word of God. Hosea would say of those people in his day, there is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. Hosea 4.1. And in Jesus' day, the Pharisees and these accounts with uh, Matthew the tax collector and Zacchaeus the tax collector, the Pharisees and self-righteous crowds had abandoned the truth of God. Jesus in his Gospels had come with one message. With one message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And with this message in mind, Jesus said to these self-righteous uh, Pharisees, For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Verse 13. There's some sort of, uh, you know, stab here by Jesus at these self-proclaimed righteous Pharisees. For I came not to call the righteous like you, but sinners like Matthew. Zacchaeus, during his dinner for Jesus, stood up before all, all gathered and said to Jesus, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Luke 19, 8. Jesus responded, Today salvation has come to this house. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Luke 19, 9 and, and 10. We see what Matthew went on to be. This is the only place in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9 to 13, where Matthew speaks of himself. We know that Matthew went on later to write the gospel that we have in our New Testament. He's often been called over the centuries Matthew the Evangelist. And his name is found in the list of Jesus' 12 apostles in the New Testament. You see, my friends, Matthew and Zacchaeus received true saving faith. And this was made manifest in a recognizable life change. Apostle Paul, who understood so much about the change in his life, from Saul, the persecutor of the church, to the Apostle Paul, to the Gentiles, said this of himself to his Dear friend Timothy and co-pastor, he said, The grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ, that are in Christ Jesus. This, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. My friends, today in Advent, the second Sunday of Advent, as we, as we make our way closer to Christmas, the question that is facing you and me, this Advent is found at the end of that dark and twisting path. By the dwindling fire 
where the child lays in the feeding trough. You see, there's no room for the advent of this holy child in many hearts today. Can we make room? Better yet, will we make room this Christmas? Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this day. May we hear this message loud and clear as we make our way closer and closer to Christmas. Lord, I pray that you would help all of us understand this deeper meaning of Christmas in a superficial culture that we live in. We thank you, Lord, for the salvation that we have in Christ and Christ alone. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for having me. Merry Christmas. Shalom.